And our second question. What is the best way Guam can improve its economy? Thank you. I think uh, one of the best ways we can do it is uh, one, through education, uh, two, through training, and taking advantage uh, of the job opportunities that are available. We all understand that, that we utilize H-2B visas uh, and the people that come in on those visas. But there are still opportunities, uh, and we have an unemployment rate where we have to put those people who are unemployed, train them, educate them, and get them into the workforce. The other thing is you have to have smart economic policies. And as Assistant Secretary, I worked with the Department of Commerce to create a Guam um, a gross, demo, gross domestic product for Guam. The Department of Commerce is the gold standard when it comes to uh, analyzing economies. And for the first time in the history of the nation, under my leadership as Assistant Secretary, the Department of Commerce started analyzing each economy of each uh, U.S. territory. And so uh, education, training, and smart economic policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. When I first entered Congress, I introduced uh, uh, the Hub Zone, uh, which is uh, legislation for Guam, all of Guam, which means that any entrepreneur, any young business person can do business with the military on contracts and so forth. I supported the University of Guam Small Business Centers. I expand Guam Industries. You can't rely on only tourism and uh, military industries. So I have proposed a third economic leg to create jobs, particularly in the area of IT and telecommunications. And I'm confident, I am confident, that the University of Guam students are the next generation that can lead in these efforts. Thank you very much. You students are the future of our island. The greatest number of jobs created in the country come from small businesses that, that start up, entrepreneurs. The small businesses that are started and the people that they employ and the revenues generated is a great economic engine. But here on Guam, in addition to that, tourism, let's face it, that's the number one employer and job creator. Number two, the military and federal jobs. But I also want to take a look at the federal programs that are out there. For example, the Native American Loan Program. Recently, I, uh, when I was in office, I, I wrote and requested for Department of Administration or Agriculture to take a look at what was called the Sustainable or sus uh, Substantially Underserved Trust Areas, called SUDA. It was approved in 2012. That would allow for federal funding for programs for government of Guam, for private nonprofit, and, and, and a one-third category. We can then build infrastructure get loans, build homes, and start new industries using federal programs, dusting them off, get them off the shelves, and let's implement these programs. Thank you. Thank you. As a banker and funder for many new businesses throughout the Silicon Valley area, I can tell you what draws business to our island is number one, having qualified personnel, having a business sense with the regulations and the mandates that are being forced on us now that are non-business friendly. And number three, having a stable medical facility that will take care of their employees that they bring to the table. We have to start at home. We have to do our work and take care of our hospital, our medical resources here on the island. We have to make sure our H2 visas come back from the Philippines. We have to make sure we work with the islands, with the COFA group, as far as training so that we can implement all of our resources. Thank you. Question three, if elected or re-elected, what is your biggest priority in the next two years? I am not a single issue candidate. I never have been when I served as uh, Lieutenant Governor, Senator, and now in the US Congress. If the people of Guam come to me with an issue, I go right at it. I always have done this and I will continue to do so. 
I go for the priorities that have included anything important to Guam and the people. And this would include war claims, economy, military, buildup, and so forth and so on. So again, I repeat, I'm not a single issue candidate. I go for whatever is important to Guam, and I will always continue this philosophy. Thank you. And there are the perennial issues that we all know of, war reparations, veterans benefits. But I believe that mo the most current issue that needs attention is the H-1B, H-2B uh, and temporary workers and, and the continuous um, refusal or denial of these applications. It, it's going to affect our construction industry. It's already affected our health industry. And that has to be the number one issue I, I believe that I have to pursue. Secondly, compact impact funding. It's affecting all of us. Unfunded federal mandates such as earned income tax credit and others that apply to Guam without any federal compensation. These need to be resolved because it continues to draw upon uh, the revenues of our island. In the class action lawsuit that was um, filed for e earned income tax credit, when we resolved it, it, it averaged about 20 million a year. It is now averaging roughly 60 million uh, a year for an unearned un un income tax credit. And so we need to resolve these, uh, these problems. Thank you. People get tired hearing me say this, compact, compact, compact. Unless we are able to control the negative impact of the compact, we cannot sustain our society our culture, our economy, our way of life is at risk. We have to work this out. Make sure that we can control the expenses. Go to our federal partners and have them be responsible to what they put to us in the original compact. If we don't do it, all the rest of this is moot. Thank you. Uh, two biggest issues for me, uh, I think administratively, would be uh, pursuing uh, greater access to care for our veterans community. We're the highest, um, we have the highest rates of enlistment, but we rank at the bottom of the barrel in terms of funding per veteran uh, from the veteran, uh, from veteran affairs per veteran on Guam. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of attention needs to be put towards the H2B visa problem. I uh, wholeheartedly agree with uh, Governor Camacho that that needs attention. That's administrative attention. Legislatively, I'm going to have priorities to, uh, uh, to have greater economic opportunity for Guam and also the perennial issue of war claims, which should have been resolved back in 2009. And it's a shame that it hasn't been resolved since. It'll be tough to bring it back, but it's something that should always remain on the plate of the delegate until that issue is resolved and that justice and parity are brought to our people. Question four, what advice do you have for students who desire to work in public service? Well, students, you know, your generation, you're the millennials, and uh, there's a, an acronym called EPIC, E-P-I-C, which pretty much describes you. You're experiential, you, you are participatory, you're image-driven, and you're connected. Public service is a noble cause. It's a noble occupation. Um, it is a profession like many others. And, um, and if, you, if you decide to answer that call, I would recommend stay in school. Get as much education as you possibly can. Prior to going into public service, if you have a, a, the possibility of working in the private sector, do so because that's real world experience. You get uh, a tremendous amount of, of training. Thirdly, improve your skill level at whatever expertise or interest you have. Pursue your dreams because we find that many of these individuals that come into government from private sector bring with them the drive, the initiative, you know, the expertise. Bring that and help be a public servant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my advice for students who desire to work in public service do it. The island needs good leaders. The world needs good leaders, and our nation needs good leaders. 
I started my kind of uh, interest in public service uh, with former Governor Ricky Berdallo and also with uh, Congresswoman Berdallo and former Senator Elizabeth Ariola. It's uh, the mentorship that I got from them uh, was invaluable and the experience that I've had along the way also with your president, uh, former Congressman Robert Underwood, is something that I value. Most importantly, once you get into public service, you can't lose touch with the people. You always got to talk to them. You got to figure out what their priorities are because that's what you need to be fighting for. You need to make Guam the best place as it can be for whomever calls Guam home. But do public service, it's a sacrifice for you and your family, but it's so rewarding uh, and you can tell from, from the good people and qualified people that are up here uh, seeking your vote for delegate. Thank you. It is a tremendous honor to take the responsibility to serve your communities and your island. The one thing I ask you, in addition to all the education, keeping up on the issues in particular in those areas you wish to serve, you have to bring your heart into this. At the end of the day, you need to realize that the people you serve are your friends and your families, and you're doing this for a greater cause than just finding a career path. If you don't have that, then maybe it's not the job for you. Thank you. Well, believe it or not, I began my married life 27 years doing public service. I never ever received a paycheck until I was elected in the Senate. And it was quite a thrill. But when I speak, and I founded several nonprofit organizations over the years, and many of them are very active today. My husband really introduced me into politics. I was working for him, campaigning for him, and he decided I knew a lot of people out there and maybe you should get involved. So because of that, I've served two terms as first lady, five terms as a senator, two terms as a lieutenant governor, and now seven terms as your representative in Congress. When I speak to young people, such as yourself, students, I always say, if you're interested in politics, get into public service at the beginning. Volunteerism is so very gratifying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question five. How can the government of Guam have a stronger voice with the federal government? Thank you. Our government offers us a seat at the table, but in order to be heard, we have to be there. We have to be a force at that table, bringing the concerns of our citizens to the forefront. We have a responsibility to those people who have put their faith and trust in us to work hard on their behalf. It doesn't happen overnight. We all know that. But it does happen a lot quicker if you are an active participant in the process. Our relationship with the federal government has to be made stronger. We need to seek representation, um, a voting representation, and possibly even representation in the Senate. But the people that you can influence make a great deal of difference. Thank you. How do we have a stronger voice with the federal government? As a delegate and as a representative of your people in Washington, D.C., that is your responsibility. You have to be an advocate for your people and use the full resources of your position in Congress to represent the best interest of your people. And you do that with respect. You do that with collaboration. You do that with effectiveness. You do that representing the character of your people and the island of Guam. And, and that's where it, it comes in. I tell you as governor, all it took was effective communication, making our case, presenting the numbers, letting them understand what our challenges were. And when they understood it, they became partners with us on many different fronts, working with us and excited about finding ways 
to use federal programs to help our people. But it is our voice as a people and as a delegate that will make the difference. That's the job of the delegate. How can the government of Guam have a stronger voice with the federal government? Well, <laughs> I guess I'll say send me back to Washington as your delegate. I approach every issue, every Guam issue, with a one Guam voice. I work across the aisle. You have to. Guam has one seat in a Congress with 541 members. Think about that. So I've always worked across the aisle, and I've been very successful. I work very closely with Governor Camacho, Governor Calvo, the legislature, the mayors, and the people. So remember, in order to have a stronger voice in federal government, bring everybody together. Go forward with one Guam voice. Thank you. Um, yeah, the first thing you want to do is you want, to, you want to, your delegate to be a strong voice for you. You want a delegate that's passionate about the issues. You want a delegate that has experience, not only in the legislative branch of government, but dealing with the federal bureaucracy. And that's something that I've done. It's always helpful to have a Team Guam approach. And that's ideally what you want. In addition to that, I've been on public record by saying, that Guam needs to have the ability, the government of Guam specifically needs to have the ability to be able to hire counsel in Washington, D.C. There's not a state, a district, um, a, a county, uh, an interest group that doesn't have additional counsel to help influence lawmakers. And yes your, yes, your delegate is your strongest voice, but it doesn't help to add to that team. Puerto Rico, a U.S. territory, has about 50 lobbyists working on their behalf. We have a public law on our books that prevents us from doing that. And I think it handicaps us as we move forward on issues that are important to us. Thank you very much. Question number six. How can medical services for our military veterans be improved? Ladies and gentlemen, we can never do enough because we owe a debt of gratitude for the sacrifices that our veterans have gone through. Right now, the services need to be improved. We have a brand new naval hospital. I established 14 years ago a veterans council. It still meets today, 14 years later, and we meet once a month. I found the funding for the CBOC which is the clinic up at the Naval Hospital. We've overgrown it. Now we need an expansion. So I found 5.5 million for an expansion and also to add more doctors and nurses. The veterans are now seen in the North and South community health clinics. And also in the National uh, Defense Authorization Act, I have a review with the AAPI award upgrade for Guam Medal of Honor veterans who never received their medals. Thank you. Thank you. As a prior candy striper at the Naval Hospital in Aganya Heights during the Vietnam War, this is personal. We have a test program going on in the United States right now with five military hospitals participating in taking veterans. The hospital makes more money by billing the veterans the veterans, by b billing veteran administration, the veterans get immediate care and they get specialists. They also, the Veterans Association pays less than they would normally pay by sending people off island or to other states. And this is a new form of income to the military hospital. I would love to fight and I have been working with the commander, Kamlish, over at the Naval Hospital to try to see if we could have Guam accepted as one of those test centers. It would be a slam dunk. We are the most remote territory and our veterans deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this issue should be personal for each and every one of us in their, this room. I don't believe there's a family that doesn't have a veteran in it. Um, and with no disrespect to my competitor, 
I'm sure that Ms. Metcalf and former Governor Camacho have gone and talked to veterans. And by and large, the veterans that have spoke to me have said they are dissatisfied with the leadership that, that they currently have that, that, to fight on their behalf. We're not talking about just medical services that veterans um, uh, aren't able to access. We're talking about simple things like getting an appointment, going through the, going through the gate, uh, uh, talking to somebody on the phone, getting your prescription. These are like simple issues, administrative issues that our veterans, that are ones I've spoken to, have said that they just don't feel that the leadership that's currently there has been fighting for them. A letter or a call isn't enough. You need to go knock on a door. You need to ask the secretary to sit down with you and tell him these problems. Thank you. I recently talked to a, a psychiatrist who takes care of many patients up at the, the facility outside of Naval Hospital, the community-based outreach center. And I asked her, doctor, in one sentence, could you describe or tell me what, we, what is most important for the veterans? What do they need? She says, Felix, they need more of everything. They need more of everything. When you look at primary care, mental health, women's health care, specialty care, the um, TBI, homelessness, veterans benefits, the problem that they face continuously is frustration because, as was pointed out, the process of, of applying for a disability or, or seeking service is so cumbersome and ineffective, and they're looking for ways to improve the system. That's what we need to focus in on, how to improve the system for their benefit.